So this is a nice picture of the gentleman whom we are commemorating today. He practiced in Marseille, and it was in 1878 or something like that that he published his article in which he described the four features of La Maladie Bleue that he had found in the majority of cases that came through his practice as a forensic pathologist working in Marseille. And he had noted that these, ha these cases had in common a ventricular septal defect, an interventricular communication, as he called it, biventricular origin of the aorta, infundibular stenosis to the pulmonary pathways, and then completing the triad, the quadrat, the tetrad, rather, that we describe in his name, right ventricular. And if we see examples of this entity, we can all immediately recognize what he's talking about, what he was talking about, because the essence of Tetralogy of Fallow is that it is recognizable on the basis of its phenotype. So here is one of the nicest pictures that, uh, that I've seen. It's one that was taken by Anton Becker. It was already in Anton Becker's collection when I arrived in Amsterdam in 1973, which is when I started my lifelong collaboration with Anton Becker. And what you see very nicely here is the interventricular communication. You will appreciate that we're looking up from the apex of the right ventricle. And so through the interventricular communication, you can see that the aortic valve is supported by at least half of its circumference within the right ventricle. So unequivocally, a biventricular aortic communication. And here you see the narrowed subpulmonary outflow tract with this thick muscular structure here encroaching on the outflow tract together with these hypertrophied septoparietal trabeculations, which we'll talk about very shortly, and then completing the tetrad, the thickening of the right ventricular wall. And it's now generally agreed that this right ventricular hypertrophy is a hemodynamic consequence of the anatomic findings. So, for quite some time, we tried to suggest that the cardinal anatomic feature of this entity, in one of our own specimens here seen from the apex of the right ventricle, was anterocephalad, deviation of the outlet septum relative to the septomarginal trabeculation. And as I say, we had promulgated that concept time when we appreciated that it didn't always work because the simple anterocephalad deviation of the outlet septum relative to the septomarginal trabeculation does not discriminate between Fellows Tetralogy and the so-called Eisenmenger ventricular septal defect. And here you see the subcostal equivalent cut of an Eisenmenger ventricular septal defect that I photographed in the Pittsburgh archive. So you will appreciate the right atrium, the septomarginal trabeculation that here is cradling the ventricular septal defect, and this is a feature of the ventricular septal defects or interventricular communications we're going to be talking about throughout this afternoon. Unequivocally, there is overriding of the aorta since our section in paralleling the oblique subcostal equivalent has bisected the aortic root. So you see the half of the aorta here that retains its connection within the left ventricle. And unequivocally here, there is also deviation of the muscular outlet septum relative to the septomarginal trabeculation. But in this situation, the subpulmonary outlet is unobstructed, and indeed one of the features of the Eisenmenger ventricular septal defect is that it potentiates to pulmonary vascular disease, and these are the patients who develop early pulmonary vascular disease, and sadly, unless palliated very early in their life. In the old days, these are the ones who died at a relatively young age with pulmonary hypertension. So simple anterocephalad deviation of the outlet septum relative to the septomarginal trabeculation is insufficient to a feature of tetralogy of fallow.
And if we then take an example of unequivocal tetralogy and we section it in comparable fashion again, simulating the subcostal anterior oblique equivalent, then we can see that part of the features are indeed there. So we see that the outlet septum is deviated anterocephalad relative to the septomarginal trabeculation. You can see again we have sectioned through the aortic root, which is bisected in this particular cut. But the other feature that combines with deviation of the outlet septum to produce the phenotype of tetralogy of fallow is hypertrophy of the septomarginal, septoparietal trabeculations. And it is the combination of these two features, deviation of the outlet septum along with hypertrophy of the septoparietal trabeculations that produces the muscular squeeze at the mouth of the infundibulum that is the phenotypic feature of tetralogy. So if we compare the arrangement as seen in tetralogy with the situation we find in the normal heart, we can show the how the building blocks of the outflow tract are malformed in tetralogy when compared to the normal situation. So our cartoon here is showing you the septal surface of the right ventricle having cut away the outflow tract. And then we note the location of the membranous septum. Andrew has shown you this several times now during our course, transilluminated to illustrate its atrioventricular and its interventricular components. And you're all well aware now that one of the major characteristics of the normal right ventricle is the presence of this extensive strap-like muscular structure that reinforces the septal surface of the right ventricle, which we call the septomarginal trabeculation, which in North America is still often called the septal band. And you know it has a posterior limb giving rise to the medial papillary muscle, an anterior limb that extends up towards the pulmonary valve, and a body that extends down towards the ventricular apex, giving rise to a series of septoparietal trabeculations that I'll mention shortly. But the other important structure forming the septal surface of the right ventricle, yet not a septal structure, is this inner curvature of the ventricular mass. And we call this the inner curve, likening it to the stomach, which has an inner curve and a greater curve. So this outer margin of the right ventricle would be the greater curve. This is the inner curve extending up from the membranous septum towards the freestanding subpulmonary infundibulum. And this part of the inner curve, which I've shown in these two shades of green, is encircling the aortic outflow tract. And this is the part that we call the ventriculo-infundibular fold. Since it is a fold, and within the interstices of the fold, we find the right coronary artery. But sandwiched between the inner heart curvature and the bifurcating arms of the septomarginal trabeculation is this small part of the normal muscular septum, which can be removed with a scalpel so as to enter the left ventricular outflow tract, but in the normal heart there are no landmarks to tell you where it starts and where it finishes. So, to all intents and purposes in the normal heart, we consider this as confluent with the septomarginal trabeculation, but it is there. Also important is the freestanding muscular infundibular sleeve that is supported by the inner heart curvature, and it is, of course, the presence of that freestanding sleeve that permits the pulmonary valve in the normal heart to be removed for use in the Ross procedure. And then finally, the series of septoparietal trabeculations, one of which is the moderator band, that extend from the anterior margin of the septomarginal trabeculation and run round the parietal free wall, the greater curvature of the right ventricle. Now what happens in tetralogy of fallow is that these building blocks that wall the aorta into the left ventricle come apart at this point between the arms of the septomarginal trabeculation. So this is the comparable situation seen in 
tetralogy of fallow. And now the interventricular communication is cradled between those limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. Here, the posterior limb, giving rise to the medial papillary muscle, and here, the anterior limb. And the interventricular communication, as I've just mentioned, is between these two limbs. And the major reason that the building blocks have come apart is because the outlet part of the septum is now recognizable in its own right as a septal structure separating the subpulmonary outlet from the subaortic part outlet arising from the right ventricle. And as you have just seen, that outlet septum or the conal septum or the parietal band is deviated in anterocephalad fashion relative to the anterior limb of the septomarginal trabeculation. And as I've just shown you, it's that squeeze between the outlet septum and the hypertrophied septoparietal trabeculations that produces the infundibular obstruction. But note that just as in the normal heart, supported by this infundibulum, is a freestanding component that would again permit the leaflets of the pulmonary valve to be removed without encroaching upon the left ventricle. And note again that the part of the aorta supported within the right ventricle has as its support the ventricular infundibular fold, this again being the inner heart curvature. And in most instances, the moving apart of these building blocks leaves the membranous septum exposed in the posterior inferior margin of the interventricular communication, hence making it perimembranous. But as I will also show you, this is not always the case. So if we look at those muscular structures that have come apart in another heart that I've sectioned in subcostal oblique orientation, you see here the septomarginal trabeculation, the septal structure reinforcing the right ventricle, and you note how the muscular outlet septum is deviated in anterocephalad fashion. You now very nicely see the hypertrophied septoparietal trabeculations, and it is the squeeze that is producing the obstructed mouth to the subpulmonary infundibulum. But what you see particularly well in this oblique subcostal section is the muscular inner heart curvature that interposes here between the leaflet of the tricuspid valve and the leaflet of the aortic valve, the aortic valve now supported in the right as well as the left ventricle, and this, in this particular instance, is producing discontinuity between those valvar structures. And if we now concentrate exclusively on that subpulmonary outlet, here is a removed subpulmonary outlet from a patient with tetralogy of fallow, and there you see the aortic valve supported by its aortic sinus. Here the leaflet of the pulmonary valve, and you can now note that there is a deep fatty tissue plane between the two, and the presence of this tissue plane <coughs> shows us that only the apical part of this muscular structure is a true intracardiac septal structure, and that that supports this freestanding infundibular pulmonary sleeve, just as in the normal heart, albeit that in tetralogy of fallow, this infundibulum is narrowed in consequence of the squeeze at its mouth between the deviated outlet septum and the hypertrophied septoparietal trabeculations. So we can recognize tetralogy on the basis of its phenotype, but it is not the case that all examples are the same. So there is variation in terms of the right ventricular margins of the interventricular communication, the extent to which the aorta is attached in the right as opposed to the left ventricle, the nature of the subpulmonary obstruction itself, or the associated malformations. So the majority of cases, at least three-quarters and probably four-fifths, have a perimembranous defect because there is fibrous continuity, posteroinferiorly, between the leaflets of the aortic and tricuspid valve. So as I explained to you earlier today, exactly the same rules can be used to determine the phenotype of the interventricular communication as when we are dealing with isolated defects. So in perhaps one-fifth of cases, we have the situation as you see here, 
where the interventricular communication remains clasped between the limbs of the septomarginal trabeculation. But in these cases, you see that the ventricular infundibular fold separating the leaflets of the aortic and tricuspid valve extends to become confluent with the posterior inferior rim of the septomarginal trabeculation. So we have this extensive muscular structure which interposes between the membranous septum and the edge of the defect. And when surgeons are confronted with a situation like this, they can place stitches all the way around the margins of the defect without fear of damaging the conduction axis. And then there is a third variant, as you see here, which for quite some time we argued was not strictly to Tralgia Fellow, since it lacked muscular obstruction, but we now recognize is certainly part of the family of Tetralgia fallow, since it has overriding of the aorta, and it has unequivocal hypertrophy of the septoparietal trabeculations. But the characteristic feature of this particular defect is that the narrowing of the pulmonary trunk is produced by a fibrous raphe rather than a deviated muscular outlet septum. And the reason for this, of course, is that as in all cases with doubly committed and juxtaarterial defects, the subpulmonary infundibulum has failed to muscularize during. And note that in that particular case, the defect extended to become perimembranous. It is, however, probably the variability in aortic override that has created greatest controversy. There is no question that when the aorta predominantly is supported by the left ventricle, then effectively we are dealing with concordant ventriculo-arterial connections. There is also no question that in some patients with tetralgia fallow, the aorta is predominantly supported by the right ventricle. And the question then is how to describe these cases. And from our stance, unequivocally, when more than half of the aorta is supported by the right ventricle along with the entirety of the pulmonary trunk, effectively we are dealing with a double outlet connection. And we'll return to that after T in the context of double outlet. Another controversial issue when I started work on this with Anton Becker is whether the infundibulum in tetralgia fallow was too short. So in one of our earliest papers, we measured the length of the right ventricle from the apex to the attachments of the pulmonary valve and we took that as one and we then graphed, we then took a ratio against that of the length of the subpulmonary infundibulum. And as you see, in a series of 14 cases with Fallows tetralogy, the pulmonary infundibulum on average was 0.36 of the length of the right ventricle. And we then compared that with a series of normal hearts, again measuring the normal subpulmonary infundibulum relative to the length of the right ventricle. And we were surprised to find that in normal hearts, the subpulmonary infundibulum, in fact, was only 0.28 of the normal dimensions. So in the series of hearts that we looked at, in fact, the infundibulum was significantly shorter, albeit that, sorry, the sidfundibulum was significantly longer than the, in the normal, albeit that in some instances it could indeed be short. So there is a spectrum of infundibular length. The infundibulum unequivocally is too narrow, but it is certainly not the case. It is always too short.